Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We are going to start our conference for today. Welcome to everybody who has joined us. The topic of today is an update, or it's our first public update on the Trace Alliance Supply Chain Data Interoperability and Semantic Web Working Group. So you're all very welcome. My name is John Kill. I'm based here in Toronto, and I'm the chairman of the work group and also professor of practice at the McGill Center for the Convergence of Health and Economics. What I will do in the first uh, few moments is give you an overview of the agenda for today. Then I'll talk about uh, the activities. I'll give about a 15 minute update on the work group activities. After the activities, we'll do a panel discussion and then we'll have the FTA update. So what is this Trace Alliance Working Group all about? The purpose of the group is to bring together global companies, technology providers, government agencies and academics to collaborate on creating a commons based what we call open source framework and recommendations that will contribute to seamless communications between disparate information technology systems in the public and private sector. And right now we've started off in a very, very unusual way because the McGill Center for the Convergence of Health and Economics under the leadership of Professor Lorette Dubay and uh, myself in the group We've taken the leadership of, uh, of the, uh, the, the work group. And this is very interesting because it fits perfectly in with the mandate of the McGill Center, which is to create a virtual world network of scientists, action leaders, policy leaders that promote the weaving of digital powered interdisciplinary science and, and evolving that into trying to figure out what is dividing us in the marketplace and the economy and trying to develop more collaborative, modular, convergent innovation platforms. On my side, I'm looking at developing large scale interoperable digital ecosystems for the agro food sector, but the center goes much broader and wider on that. There is a link here to Professor uh, Dubay's profile and also to the MCCHE work group if you're interested in looking at that. Further, within, uh, within our group, we've developed something called FCIE, or Food Convergence and Innovation Ecosystems. Now, this is a new model that we've evolved over the past two to three years with some of the theoretical learnings and also practical learnings of rolling this out in Vietnam. This model here at every dial on the clock, if I could call it that, has a specific purpose. And we believe that these are the specific units or entities that the food industry needs. On the top is assurance, which is all of the work that will be done in laboratories. At one o'clock here, research is the qualitative and quantitative research, technology pilots and proof of concept. This is where we fit in today. This is the research that we're doing right now on data interoperability and semantic web. So we fit into that side, which you can imagine that there's many, many more universities involved with us. And I'll give you an example of the collaboration we have across different universities on this project. Then as a component of outreach or what's called capacity building. How do we do capacity building on data interoperability and semantic web? We still have to reach that point. But there are organizations today that do capacity building and outreach like GS1 and others that try to educate on the standards and capabilities that are out there to drive more efficient and interoperable supply chains. On the technology side, you can imagine that in here, there's many, many different solution providers that have fantastic technology. Most of it is proprietary. What we're trying to do is get all of these parties and players together to say that does it make sense for us to share information through a neutral, interoperable platform like the Origin Trail protocol? And there may be other protocols out there, but the key point then is, can we even connect these platforms together? And on the advisory side, this is the business and strategy advisory, and also some of the academic stuff, what's happening out there and the work we're doing with, uh, with the Trace Alliance group is also that academic advisory. Incubation, at, uh, from a McGill perspective, we look at this as nurturing small companies to help them get to the market with new product design and so on. Insights is market and consumer research, which is also part of the research work. And then you have the markets, which is the actual platforms. How can you roll out these platforms? Now, there are multiple technology companies up here, 
and we have active projects going within Canada and abroad as well. So this will give you a notion. I think this is the first time that we're actually talking about this in public. And this is a model that has evolved over the past two to three years. Uh, and we've tested it out in Vietnam. It, essentially, a company that wants to join in here can join at any one of these bullet points. If they have a problem with assurance, we can bring them in through that angle or through advisory or through research. The other thing we do is we look at the five pillars of the food system. It's not just about food safety. We look at what's needed around food quality, what's required around food safety to bring safe products to the market. Now, you may, be, you may often hear the term about food fraud, but here we talk about food authenticity. How do we know if food is authentic? Food fraud are the things that occur like dilution, substitution, mislabeling, that makes a food inauthentic. Food defense may be a new term for many of you. So if food fraud is counter criminal, food defense is counter terrorist. Think of ideological uh, terrorist activities where they may try to poison water or food to cause deliberate harm. And food security has nothing got to do with the actual physical movement of the goods. It's got to do with the ongoing supply of safe, affordable, nutritious food to meet the daily needs and, and consumers' preferences. Now, each of these have a definition or multiple definitions. The key point here is that there are different policy instruments across all five, and there's also different industry in instruments and standards that address uh, all five of these separately. And of course, the four pillars on the left-hand side, they will impact food security. So we're looking at it this way, and it's not a one brush uh, stroke across all of the food sector. We really, really are looking at when we develop the solutions and when we put them together as an architecture that we can look at transparency, standards, regulations, science, technology, and trust across all of these because the requirements will be different. And we do that by looking at it through different views. This is a six house view that we used to use in the previous life. We look at the business view. So if, I, if it was a house, why do I want a new house? The technical view, how will it be built? The functional view, what should the new house give me? The implementation view, with what will it be built? A standards view, what global standards should it comply to? And a policy view, what regulations should it comply to? Now, currently what we're doing is we're actually adding a seventh view to this, which is an academic view. What is the current state of knowledge? So this model will evolve. Now, for most of you, these terms that I've used here, this five pillars of the food system and these six views of a house analogy and building a solution, these will be new terms. We will come back to these in future discussions around the work group and what we're doing at McGill. So the first thing we did on the research component was a systematic literature review and bibliometric analysis using RStudio with BiblioShiny and also VosViewer. Our keyword terms were interoperability and semantic web. Here are the collaboration partners that we have outside of uh, McGill. We have also Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, NUIG in my hometown in Galway, Ireland, Lincoln University in the UK, Colorado State, uh, Toulouse Business School. We got a Hungarian business school, Trace Labs, of course, University of Portsmouth, and we have interns on board with us from McGill, uh, UBC, and also the University of Toronto. So quite, quite a big team of uh, academics looking at this. And some of these academics that are working with us are the leaders uh, in, in, uh, in the world, in their field. So for example, from Toulouse Business School, we have Professor Samuel Fossawamba, who's one of the top five most cited academics in the area of uh, big data and uh, also in AI highly referenced. We also have, uh, we looked at where are the publications coming from on interoperability plus semantic web. So when we do this type of review, we understand what kind of, what kind of papers are out there. You see here, there's a significant amount of what we would call non-peer reviewed conference papers versus the articles which would be peer reviewed. And then we look at the different journals who are focused in this area. This gives us some in indication of where to focus our attention. 
We also looked at the most productive countries and where these projects are, where the academics are the most active. Of course, here you see the United States is very active, followed by Germany, United Kingdom, Italy, and Spain. Other flavors of this type of reporting will tell us, and we can actually match the citations. A citation means that an academic found the paper insightful and useful in their own argument or their own contribution to knowledge, and they have cited the paper. So we can see that uh, in some cases, the number of publications by country may not always align with the number of citations uh, by country and also by, by academic as well. When we look at the most productive institutions, very happy to see that uh, one of our members, uh, which is the National University of Ireland, is the top producer. This is fantastic. And number three is actually the same institution up to 2008. This was a collaboration between NUIG in Galway and Innsbruck or Carlsberg University, one of the two, I'm not sure exactly. But from 2008, the DERI, Derry Institute, was a part of National University in Ireland. We have Professor John Breslin and two of his senior researchers with us on the group as well. Now that group, uh, Derry, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it was formed in about 2003. So quite some time ago, and they've been doing a lot of uh, uh, really, really spectacular work in the area of uh, interoperability and semantic web. And I believe some of their algorithms were already used by uh, US government, UK, and across the EU as well. So down here on this list, you'll also see Professor Breslin with 12 papers. Now, when you, when you look at this, you may say, okay, what is the, what is the value of this? We're looking at the top authors and co-authorship, and we're trying to figure out who's generating the knowledge and how is the knowledge being brought to market. So if you look at the top authors here, uh, Domingu and Girard the second, they have never collaborated. If you look at the third and the fourth, Dumonté and, and Chet, they have also never collaborated. So we're finding that the top authors are not actually collaborating among themselves, which may point to some other reasons for that in the marketplace, and we're not sure why that is. But this means that we're gonna to have to go in and look at nearly all of these papers here, and hopefully with the help of Professor Breslin to figure out what's really happening in that sector and how have we evolved knowledge around interoperability and semantic web over the last 20 years. These are some of the keywords and clusters that we've also identified co-occurrences of keywords across the different papers. Now that may not, not be very interesting to uh, most people on the call, but these graphs and these charts are uh, very, very valuable for academics to be able to mine into some of the key areas and extract more knowledge. So the next steps on the group, we're gonna complete the academic work and drafting of a working paper, analyzing the top 20 to 50 papers. And we'll identify gaps in knowledge, identify potential proof of concepts, and also pilots and develop some use cases. Very, very soon, possibly within the next two weeks, we will make an announcement of the working group members, which are policymakers. We do have two governments on board. Uh, we have one government and a government research agency, I should say, uh, NGOs, industry and professional associations, standards bodies, and we have businesses and also technology solution providers. So we're very excited about the types and, and, and shapes of these companies and how it's all forming together. They're all very, very interested in contributing to this very, very important work. Once we get uh, do that announcement, we will share the working paper with the working group members to be able to get views from different angles. So on that, I would like to invite Steve Sinsky and Branimir to open up, and we're going to go through a short panel discussion. Well, maybe about 30 minutes. Um, can you see, Steve, are you up and up? Yep. Oh, let me do uh, a stop share here. Um, so we're going to start with, uh, with some questions. I did, by the way, get some great questions from uh, people on Twitter last night. So thank you to everyone who, uh, who shared some questions. But Brandon, I want to ask you first. Um, so why is it important to form a work group for 
data interoperability and semantic web. Yeah, uh, first of all, hi everybody and uh, welcome to the, the panel. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here sharing it with uh, Steve and John. And uh, yeah, uh, really jumping in directly into the question, um, the importance is really several fold, but um, if we zoom out and look at the problems that we're trying to solve with uh, both as ourselves, as Trace Labs, and uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm one of the founders and the CTO of Trace Labs. Uh, we're basically the builders of the technology that is supposed to um, uh, be adopted and bring this uh, in, uh, interoperability within supply chains when it comes to data. And uh, the way we build it is with semantic technologies. Now, obviously, as core technology builders, building Origin Trail, the permissionless open source protocol, is uh, only part of the story. In order to direct the whole ecosystem, we definitely need uh, both not, not just like, like minded people, but also people driven by the same vision uh, from different uh, spectrums of uh, really academia, businesses, uh, or really just uh, research institutions. And building this uh, enormous uh, new system of supply chain that is going to go uh, towards interoperability, trust, integrity, and, and really interconnectivity uh, cannot be done by one single entity. It needs to be a group. It needs to be uh, not, not a very varied group. And it has to have rooting within uh, both the academic world. So we need, to, we need to be constantly aware of what is the state of the art and uh, where the directions uh, or the winds are uh, blowing, if you, if you might say it like that, um, both in the semantic web world, but as well as uh, associated technologies that might not be traditionally associated with them, such as blockchain technologies and DLT technology, which provide quite uh, a good tool set for uh, things that get to, uh, that have been uh, previously a problem within the semantic web world. Uh, things like digital decentralized identity, uh, which are very well uh, approached by um, the self-sovereign identity framework when it comes to uh, people, but also generally decentralized identity as the concept. Uh, things like verifiable claims, uh, which fit very well with, uh, with the semantic web world of uh, assertions or really attestations. Um, and really tokenization, you know, how do you uh, make this data that is all around the world, how do you somehow incentivize it to to get out of its its own silo and how to incentivize the, the parties to actually share as much as possible. So uh, a working group on focusing on interoperability is, uh, is really important and really focusing, looking at uh, interoperability from different angles is what is needed in order to build this very uh, enormous system and something that, that's actually gonna take years to, to uh, uh, really have a, a wide scope uh, of, of uh, adoption across multiple industries, but it's already being very adopted and, and, and needs um, this academic boost and verification, at least from the perspective of making sure that, that uh, things are indeed interoperable by those pillars of interoperability. Wonderful. Thank you, Vladimir. And for those who don't know Vladimir, Vladimir is the CTO and co-founder of Origin Trail. Uh, our next panelist is uh, Steve Simsky, or Professor Steve Simsky from Colorado State University. Uh, hi, Steve. Now, Steve, you have over 400 academic publications, your books and chapters, and you've done a tremendous amount of work with industry or in industry and also in academia. Um, we're taking a very high, unusual approach with this work group by fronting it with, uh, with academics, the ones that I mentioned earlier, including yourself. What do you see as the key benefits of, of doing that, taking that approach? Yeah, I think that, well, that's a great question, John. I mean, keep in mind, I was with HP and HP Labs for 23 years before joining CSU three years ago. So I've got to see both sides of these as the head of the security architecture team and the head of the security printing and brand protection team in HP Labs. I got to represent a rather large supply chain. I mean, HP is kind of like, if you will, in the computer area, like a Ford is, in the manufacturing space where a lot of the costs are passed through to the original suppliers. And you start to realize that once you look at a supply chain, everything is a supply chain. And I think a real big part of that is understanding that you can't escape it, right? It's like the economy of the US or Europe or China or India, you can't really escape it and think you can close that off from the rest of the world. You know, So globalization 
is a trend that really is very difficult to reverse. The same is true for supply chains, and the globalization doesn't just include looking at national jurisdictions, it looks at different types of businesses. And I think one of the things that you and the team have done here with the Trace Alliance is looked at ways to get all parties involved in that. If we do that, we have a much better chance of you know, understanding where there are anomalies. And that's a big part of understanding supply chains, not just when it's illicit trade or counterfeiting or, you know, any type of criminal activity, but also when there's inefficiencies and there's areas in the supply chain that just aren't in the right shape for what we would expect them to be. A lot of the work that we've been doing recently is trying to align multiple networks. So if you have a network of trade, if you have a network of manufacturing, if you have a network of jurisdictional taxation or other issues, and you're looking for where those don't align properly, where there are anomalies in terms of how they relate to each other, that's going to give you a good understanding of where there are inefficiencies. And that's where a company like Trace Labs or an organization like the Alliance can come in and start to help write that. And so I think really what we're talking about here is, is recognizing the fact that, you know, intercooperability, globalization, and collaboration is very important in the world that we live in. And without it, we'd really see a significant hit on the standard of living for many parts of the world. And so like it or not, it is something that we have to address and we have to move towards you know, providing that sort of safety, security, visibility, transparency, and you know, remediability, which is a very important part of that in those supply chains. And Steve, another quick question. You would have you would have recognized the six views that I have from our previous work at, at HP. How how important is it to take those multiple views of a solution as you start building it? Yeah, it's it's very important because one of the things you get by having multiple views is you can start to see the problems that you have in other spaces when you look at those. One of the things that I do at uh, Colorado State University, I teach a class in intellectual property development because I've had a lot of patents and uh, trade secrets and those types of things over the years as part of my work at HP and elsewhere. And what we do for that is say, hey, if you filter the ideas through the different sciences, if you attack your own work, if you look at it to basically try to think, you know, sort of like red team, blue team in cybersecurity, we do that for cyber physical security and we do that for intellectual property. The same type of network that you've put together with the six views, we look at the six views, for example, as how a biologist would think, how a physicist would think, how a chemist would think, mechanical, electrical, biomedical, systems engineer, all of these different views allow you to enrich what's going on and then allow you, like you've shown with some of the work in the uh, you know, publication you re represented earlier, we start to figure out how to cluster things together, what types of frameworks are going to work across multiple domains, and which types of frameworks are really just one-offs that we need to reconfigure or rethink. So it really does enrich the viewpoint. And again, it, it takes away complacency that we can often have. If we have something that's working, that is profitable, um, we tend to get complacent in those areas and figure out that that is a, you know, panglossy and best of all possible worlds where really um, it's, it's always subject to reevaluation because we always have a changing environment. Exactly. And I think the Looking at it through the six views help us build helps us build that robustness in solutions as well. If we have those multiple perspectives to really bulletproof a solution from different angles, I mean, things go wrong with implementations. A lot of systems integration projects uh, fail. I think 60% plus will have difficulties. And I think about 80% of the effort, if not 90% in some cases is actually fixing, fixing the data. So having multiple views of even something as simple as the data is, is very important. And I'm gonna ask you both this the same question. On the data side and information, um, both of you are uh, represented uh, on, on GS1 standards groups, different GS1 standards groups. Steve, you've been involved for, for some time in different areas. And, you hold a lot of patents uh, in the area of secure printing and, and imaging. And uh, Brandemir, I believe you're on the EPCIS uh, work group as well. So let me start with you, Brandemir. How important is it to embrace industry standards like GS1 uh, to ensure interoperability uh, 
out of your solution? I would say it's critically important um, because, especially in, um, in, in the aspect that uh, we're really speaking here about a, a notion of a, a kind of a fabric between the different uh, entities and companies that need to somehow um, interoperate, right? The, the, the word itself is uh, positioning the, the problem in the sort of a, a neutral space in between. Um, and and I, would, I, would, I would say that um, the, th there's been a good sort of uh, development with, with generally the, the tech industry in the last uh, several decades enabling it to be much easier to build new solutions in, in a much shorter time frame. Uh, you know, you can go and create something like, for example, back in the day when we did it in 2011, as students, we built the first, uh, pol uh, basically, uh, the um, uh, organic beef tracking uh, application. And we, we built it uh, actually very close to what EPCS is today. We, we implemented some of our own um, XML structure that resembles the GS1, EPCS, XML, and so on. But it, like basically, what, what what's great about it being easy? It's also great about it, you know, going in the direction of what you choose as a system builder and uh, as somebody who has uh, been involved in, in building such uh, technologies for over ten years. It's it's um, it's tempting, and um, uh, the standards actually answer our answer the answer to that problem. So uh, in order for not to uh, everybody have uh, a direction to go to. And uh, first of all, reinvent the wheel, solve the same problems all over again. So therefore create additional, you know, uh, just additional burden on, on all of the implementers. But also then once it's built out, it's actually able to work together. Uh, that, that means that you haven't just built a system to solve a particular problem at a particular time. You built something that's sustainable, that works for across uh, potentially multiple systems and ideally interoperates with, with things that already exist. So that's one of the key things around the EPCS, which is actually being quite adopted uh, in, in several industries. Uh, and uh, it's kind of like the English language to, to you know, supply chain uh, object tracking. So uh, it's, 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 it's the way we, within the working group, we really speak in those terms that have been standardized, both in, in you know, when we do it in digital format, but also when we, when we discuss it. And uh, without it, it's, it's hard to make something that's going to span more than one single, I would say, tiny point of a supply chain, like one single actor. Um, and that, that really is uh, the key enabler. You know, it, without having such standards, that would mean uh, basically having it impossible to implement solutions that are across multiple different systems uh, and, and therefore companies or institutions. Right. And I guess it's, it's helpful that uh, ISO has adopted GS1's EPCIS standard as the ISO interoperability standard. Are you finding that that's helpful? Yeah, and there's been more and more organizations that are coming towards GS1 EPCIS lately. Uh, from what we're seeing, the discussions are, are stemming from that GS1 EPCIS being recognized as one of the core standards, um, which, um, you know, um, having it being used for so long uh, within at least our solutions, uh, it, it comes as sort of a no, no brainer, but there are still organizations that uh, are in this discovery phase and really learning about how it's going to be done. What's great about it is that there's a new version coming out relatively soon, um, which is the 2.0 version of the standard, which is going to be much easier to use. Uh, the, the old school version of the standard, which is currently the latest one, 1 1.2, is a little old school in technical terms. so. For, for the technical audience, um, basically it, it still uses the old school SOAP interfaces, XML and stuff like that. And right now is introducing G JSON interfaces, link data, and also a couple of new interesting features like for example, IoT uh, data uh, uh, structuring and, and uh, standardization. But essentially it's, um, it's a standard that has been proven in the wild for a very long time and being updated currently. And the uh, support of ISO is definitely brought uh, a lot more attention to it. So I see it as, as something that's going to be um, more and more adopted uh, in the years to come. Several projects that we're also involved in, call, uh, one of them being the food safety market in Europe, which really um, revolves around data sharing between food safety authorities and uh, really supply all kinds of supply chain actors in Europe. Um, 
is built essentially on top of uh, GS1 EPCS as the core, as the core standard, uh, because this this food safety uh, market platform uh, would not be able to work function otherwise. Um, and uh, yeah, I encourage everybody interested to look up uh, the food safety market as well. And, and um, there's quite a few information both on our blog and, and the official website as well. Wonderful, thank you, Brandmer. Before I ask Steve the same question on the value of GS1 standards, I just want in the background, I want to give Andrew Kennedy a heads up that will uh, open up for his slot at quarter after 11. So in about 10 minutes, we'll have the FDA do the update. So Steve, over to you. you you've done a lot of work in the area with GS1. Uh, you're a practitioner, also a, an academic. H how would you look at the value uh, and importance of standardization because you worked at HP, you worked at some you know HP labs and, and you had some major, major supply chains and supply chain issues. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I started, I think, with the GS1 maybe in 2008. It's been a long time. So probably the last 13 years, the last three as a non-voting member because Colorado State doesn't have its own quote unquote supply chain. So it's not a member organization. So now I'm a consultant. I've been in everything from you know, fish and vegetable traceability all the way over to being part of the identification um, subject matter group for close to a decade now. So a lot of different groups, I'm usually involved in about two efforts in the GS1 at a time for over a decade. Um, like any other organization, I've been, I was part of the World Economic Forum Global Agenda Councils for like six years. I've been part of other ACM and IEEE and other and IS&T standards. Like all of those, they're fraught with difficulties. You have to get over the fact that, you know, people are actually on these committees. People have uh, competing needs. They have, you know, competing viewpoints about what should be the standard. But I think the whole point about it is communication. If we want to, through supply chain practices like GS1 puts together, talk about actually providing transparency and traceability, then we need to be traceable and transparent in our actions together. We have to be sharing best knowledge. It doesn't prevent a group like Trace Labs from coming in and providing significant value add over what the standard provides. And I think that's a big part of it. There is a, I think if there was an educational part of that that really matters, it would be that, hey, it's okay for you to be part of a standard and then still be able to wrap around the standard with an additional amount of functionality and additional viewpoint, et cetera. And we see that continually. The GS1 is trying to find what can be held in common to allow groups to participate in an effective and safe manner. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so we really, the other thing is, is without the GS1, right? It's kind of like the old Voltaire quote, right? If the GS1 didn't exist, we would need to invent it. There's going to have to be something there. And even if it, you know, and this is, I'm, I'm being a bit of a troll here because it's not my viewpoint, but even if we thought the GS1 was clunky, didn't move along, had no value, wasn't really doing anything, we would still need a communication vehicle like GS1 just for everybody to be able to compare notes. And the thing is, is that the GS1 is way above that. They provide, you know, an open forum for everyone to participate, for everyone to give feedback. They actually listen to that. And yes, at times it drives you crazy because it is a committee of dozens, if not hundreds of people in each of these standards, but everybody gets their viewpoint aired. Um, you know, part of the slowness is to allow everybody a chance to really cogitate. And that's really what this is all about. We have, I mean, no pun intended, but you look at what happened in the Suez Canal, supply chain is a very slow moving ship. And when it crashes, the whole thing comes down for a long period of time. It's hard to write that. And the GS1 is this sort of, as I would say from the electrical you know, in computer science side, it is a moving average filter. We are taking into account practices that extend back a long period of time because we have to assume that people in the past were no, no less brilliant than people are today, but they were limited by their technology. So we have to be able to, you know, basically deconvolve the good practices that people had with, you know, clunkier technology from the really good technology we have here that we haven't found the best practices for. And that's really what the forum like a GS1 is for. It's for taking the best practices from the past and modernizing them with leading edge types of technologies like Branamir and others bring to the table. And so, you know, I'm, I'm like everyone else, I've got plenty to do. 
you know, sitting in a GS1 meeting for two hours every week is, is a lot of time to participate, but you also remember it's periodic. There's going to be times where, you know, it's going the way you think it's going. You don't have a lot to contribute. And then there'll be point times, you know, kind of like, you know, the, the, what, how they describe war, you know, long extended periods of boredom followed by brief moments of terror where you suddenly realize, my goodness, this, I need to participate at this moment in where the standard's going or they're going to do something wrong because I happen to be out of the 200 people in it, the person who maybe has a critical insight to, to make. And that's, I think, what really matters is being able to pay attention, being able to recognize that your contribution isn't always that valuable, and then recognizing that there is a, you know, averaging filter that comes into play on this, just like they do with supply chains. It's very difficult to overnight change all of your OEMs, all of your original equipment manufacturers and your suppliers. And so you have to have a way to move from one to the other. Look at it this way. GS1 is part of asset inertia that we have out there. And John, you're an expert in this. Asset inertia is the recognition that moving into a field, we can't irrigate what to do to somebody. Additive manufacturing is a safe analogy here because we're not particularly focused on that. But if you come into a manufacturing place and you say, you need to get rid of all this old equipment and put additive manufacturing in, they'll take you to the back room and they'll show you, hey, I'm gonna lose money for the next 10 years. So 10 people like me are gonna get fired before this shows profit. You really think I'm gonna ignore the asset inertia, the capital assets I have that are gonna cost me for the next 40 quarters just so that I can make you happy about additive manufacturing. You've gotta tell me how additive manufacturing can fit into my existing infrastructure, into my capital assets and make things happen. And that's really what GS1 is about. They're about recognizing capital assets that are out there and bringing in really sharp people who have ideas and the ideas are important and the technologies are important, but they can bring them in and have them work with the capital assets so that the whole industry doesn't lose money because they just overnight shut down the investments they already had. And that's what we have, you know, we face that everywhere today. We face that with moving from fossil fuels over to, you know, electric uh, charge, electric charge vehicles, electric charge, you know, energy, energy distribution. We're working with that here in Colorado with NREL, National Renewable Energy Lab. And so this is a principle, again, that we see across multiple industries. So a great question, John. I know I probably gave you more of an answer than you wanted, but it is an area that I feel strongly about. We all know the limitations of standards. We know the slowness of that, but we also know that that moving average filter allows us to transition safely from the capital assets we have today to the ones of the future. Yeah, we, we often say that uh, GS1 standards helps organization to implement uh, regulations. And on that point, it's probably a good time right now to introduce Andrew Kennedy. Andrew, good to see you again. Andrew's from the FTA and he's gonna give us an update today. Uh, Andrew, uh, welcome and over to you. You're on mute right now. Thanks, I, I found, uh, I, I say my best things when I'm on mute actually, John. So <laughs> thank you for alerting. Um, yeah, thanks for letting me join today. I, I wanted to share um, uh, a recent announcement. We've we've created a low cost, no cost uh, food traceability challenge. I'm gonna share my screen here so you can see this. Okay, now I'm gonna walk you through it today. So yeah, so June 1st, we officially announced our low cost, no cost food traceability challenge. So this is the new era of smarter food safety uh, kind of landing page for the challenge. And I can put that up in the chat box so everyone has access to it. Um, so the idea is there are lots of traceability solutions out there, uh, lots of ideas across the supply chain. And what we wanted to do is provide solution providers uh, and, and people with just great ideas on how to solve um, traceability challenges, a chance to kind of show what they do. So, and explain how those solutions can be uh, cost effective for all points in the supply chain. So, uh, when you go to this page, if you click here to join the challenge, it will take you to this site, um, the uh, FDA New Era of Smarter Food Safety, Lower No Cost Tech Enabled Traceability Challenge. And you can see it started June 1st, it ends July 30th. Uh, and this gives you kind of a graphical overview of what the challenge is all about. So 
what what we're looking uh, for are solutions that address the traceability needs of everything from primary producers to importers, manufacturers and processors, distributors, retailers, and food service. So, so we're, we're not advertising for a solution for the FDA. What we really want to see are solutions for the supply chain. Um, and the submission is easy. So it's a, a form, a link to a, a YouTube uh, video, five minutes or less, and then a PowerPoint solution summary. So, uh, and I can give you a quick snapshot of the submission form. It's just this. Um, it's got a little information about your team, uh, the project information, uh, including where the URL is for the YouTube, and then some other information about where you heard about the challenge. So, so the form is pretty straightforward. And then uh, the PowerPoint deck we provided a quick and dirty template so that you have some idea of what that looks like. Um, so uh, uh, slides two to four, background information and summary of your solution. Slides five to nine uh, correspond to the evaluation criteria. Uh, and then if you want to describe any of your future plans. So we just put placeholders for each, um, each component. So, technical design, the, um, you know, the needs that it addresses, the innovation, um, usability, affordability, scalability and interoperability, which you're just talking about, and then future plans. So that's, that's the PowerPoint. Just so gives you an idea what those two things look like. And then the platform that you join is called Precision FDA. So you, click here to request access. And I've already logged in, so I can show you around the platform real quick. These are the solution categories, so, which we showed in the infographic. And then the process for submitting the challenge, you know, the video, the submission form, the PowerPoint. Uh, and these are links to the form and the template, which are in the Precision FDA platform. Um, and then the evaluation criteria here, so uh, needs-based, so it's got to address the traceability challenge. We kind of, it's a Rorschach test to a certain extent. We're leaving it up to you to define what the challenge is and what segments you want to address. Um, and it could be a new solution. It could be an existing solution that, uh, that you enhance to address uh, the challenge. Um, so, and it could be hardware, software, analytics, you know, and, and the YouTube video gives you a chance to actually show what the solution does and how it works in real life. So definitely encourage you to get out there and show how people actually use your solution. Um, so that addresses kind of usability. So how easy is it to get around and do things with the solution and then affordability. So it actually addresses explicitly why is the solution, why is the business model around this different? Like how is this different? than what's out there today. How do, how will this make it easier uh, to afford traceability? Because that's, you know, we talk a lot about the technology and the standards, but at the end of the day, there's gotta be affordability. It's gotta be part of the equation. So that's a really important thing to address. And then scalability and interoperability does you no good if this thing won't grow and won't connect to things that are out there already. So that, that's the evaluation criteria. We're gonna select up to 12 um, uh, of the highest performing entrants and have a, um, a winner's webinar. So people can present their solutions live, be open to the public. We'll record it and put it up on our site with links to the videos that were, were submitted uh, by the winners. So, um, so yeah, so that webpage I showed you will have the links to all the winning YouTube videos and then ultimately the invitation for the public meeting, and then after the public meeting, the recording of the public meeting. So uh, then additional information, I get this a lot from solution providers. Are we attaching your IP? Are we actually asking you to upload code or do you have to develop on the Precision FDA platform and give us rights to the code? Absolutely not. We're just asking for a PowerPoint, uh, the YouTube video and the form. And because we recognize that 
Um, your IP is what makes your the engine go for your company. So we don't want to attach that as part of this challenge. Um, so it's really, we're just asking for the right to be able to display the video uh, and talk about your solution on the page. Um, so this is the team. If you have any questions uh, through the platform, you can, you can log in and there's a discussion forum in here under low or no cost uh, tech and evil traceability challenge. I've already put up um, you know, answers to frequently asked uh, questions that I, I get all the time um, about, you know, why are we doing this? Um, have we hosted challenges before? Things like this and, and some resources available to address your question about what kind of challenges exist for traceability. Uh, what do we get out of it and what does the food industry get out of it? So I answered a few of those and then there's um, other FAQs under there that you can see. So Chelsea, uh, David, some of the other team members have answered some questions that come up frequently. So, and then you can see under the comments, you can add comments and we answer questions under those comments kind of in real time. So, and the Precision FDA platform has a complete development environment for working with big data sets related to precision health applications. It's not required to use this, but you are more than welcome to use this platform if you want to develop an application in it. So totally up to you. And you can see other challenges that are out there in the Precision FDA platform. So this is not the only challenge. There are other challenges out there. So you can kind of see how other challenges have run, other solutions to get an idea of you know, what else has uh, been done in the past. So I think I covered everything, but I have more, more than welcome um, any questions and I'll make sure to put this link in the chat box. Wonderful, thank you, uh, Andrew, for that. Uh, how long do we have you? Do we have you for, I know you have a time restraint uh, today. I, uh, I'm, I'm uh, good up to 12. Okay, wonderful. So um, if, if there's any questions that we pose that you, you cannot answer or address direct uh, or directly, Andrew, just let us know and we respect that. Um, can you can you talk briefly? I'll ask Steve and, and Branimir if they have questions, but uh, can you put the challenge in context of the new era of smarter food and the types of technologies that you're exploring right now within that new era of smarter food context? Yeah, great question. So this is the new era of smarter food safety blueprint that we've developed and launched last year. So we have four core elements under the blueprint, uh, tech-enabled traceability, smarter tools and approaches for prevention and outbreak response, uh, new business models in retail modernization and food safety culture. So I co-lead tech-enabled traceability. So this is uh, the where I work uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And really it's three major uh, components to this. So developing the, the foundational components is all about uh, creating the language of traceability, uh, promulgating it, and making sure it's, uh, things are interoperable. So that's kind of the base layer for traceability is, is you know, the, the language of traceability. So that's step one. And we're working on that with our proposed rule on food traceability. So that will help um, accomplish some of these goals. You know, talking about critical tracking events and key data elements and what's important to us for our use case, which is solving foodborne illness outbreak. So doing trace back investigations, doing trace forwards, specifically re related to food safety. So that that's kind of, uh, we're working on that. And I think that will provide a good base layer of CTs and KDEs. Obviously, it doesn't solve every use case out there, but at least it's a start and creates a little bit of uniformity in how we talk about traceability. Exactly. Um, the next uh, component is in encouraging and incentivizing the adoption of technologies related to traceability. And that's where this solution is coming from, so, or this challenge is coming from. So as part of it, we're trying to encourage tech vendors 
to develop low and no cost solutions. That's where this challenge kind of originated out of. And then at the end of the day, like once we have great traceability language, we have solutions out there to collect it and share it, what do we do with it? So that's all about leveraging the digital transformation. So what are the use cases? What are the systems we need to develop internally? Uh, what, you know, how do we actually use that data? And how do we get better at communicating to the world like with the format? How, do, how, do, how would we get the data into the FDA? Like, so we're also thinking about that and how do we ask for it? How do we get it? What do we do with it? Gotcha, that's great. So let, let me ask uh, Steve first, if you have any questions for, for Andrew. And, and Steve, uh, Andrew has also spent extensive time, you may have met previously at GS1 uh, groups. Andrew used to be part of some GS1 groups in the past. The best yeah, I mean, I guess the you know there is a question in the chat from uh, Brian Bedard about what is the current status of integration convergence sharing of national public agency and private sector supply chain agri-food traceability data using EPCIS. I know of some efforts in that space. I think that's a really good question for um, Andrew as well. Is like has what is the largest scale of EPCIS implementation? that he's seen for people doing this to enable that sort of, you know, not a traceability for an individual, you know, uh, vector or an individual organization, but actually across multiple organizations. Have you seen a lot of that really coming together across multiple, you know, partners and across multiple organizations, even, you know, private public types of cooperation in EPCIS? Uh, yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, so, <laughs> Uh, as background, I, I was co-chair for uh, EPCIS, um, uh, uh, you know, a couple of different working groups and worked on the um, addition of batch lot traceability into EPCIS with Ken Traub. So, yeah, I go, I go way back on EPCIS, absolutely. So, um, yeah, so, so the reality is, uh, now, when we ask for data as the FDA, we don't ask for it um, as like EPCIS or XML. Like we just don't. That's not that's not in our wheelhouse today. So honestly, since we don't ask for it, we don't see it. So we we've started you know exploring and looking at uh, the potential for using that and trying to develop the language on how we would request that data set knowing their companies that are you know they're collecting data in epcis format but developing the systems internally to process you know xml files or json files uh, with epcis you have to have the receiving layer so even if we ask for it it wouldn't necessarily do us any good if we don't have any place to put it so so we haven't really been exposed to many systems uh from that level so the way we get data today our, our data requests we ask for things like you know the the commercial uh EOs, invoices packing lists uh and then you know potentially spreadsheets with traceability information but that's kind of where it stopped and you know improving that and thinking about how we can do a better job of asking for you know xml and json um you know that there's this potential to get there we just have to do some work on our side before we actually see you know, data sets like that. So I, I wish I had a, a better lens into it, but frankly, we still get mostly just spreadsheets and, and POs and quite a number of handwritten documents, actually. You'd be, be shocked. So, um, so we see it a wide diversity of, of data coming in into the agency through outbreak investigations today. That's okay. That's cool. a oh, question on that. Yeah, the follow on. Uh, thanks, Andrew. That's a really good answer. And that's been my experience as well. A lot of folks are very much aware of EPCIS, but they don't necessarily provide that. I've seen that in sort of what I would call the high end ingredients area. So cocoa, coffee, palm oil, other areas like that, where there's a where you have a raw material that can be used further down in the chain, but it also has command some 
pretty high price itself. And then there's a strong effort, especially in cocoa and coffee, maybe now more in palm oil for people to try to acquire those goods in an equitable, more equitable fashion, uh, you know, rather than, you know, doing a one-off, actually reinvesting in the folks who are, uh, you know, farming that those ingredients. I guess at the point that you're looking at, we haven't necessarily seen those wrapped in EPCIS you know, schema yet, but we see people using the principles of EPCIS to make that happen. And I think that comes back to some of this we had earlier. There are a good set of principles that we try to advance. They don't always get advanced as standards, but they've still made a pretty significant positive impact, even where the standards themselves have not been followed to the, you know, to, to the dotting the I's and crossing the T's on all of the different standards. So thanks, Andrew. Yeah, I think that that does a good job of, you know, fitting my picture of what I've seen here, too. Thanks, Steve. So before I go, yeah, on to it, earlier, uh, go, on, go, Steve, uh, uh, Andrew, go ahead. Oh, I, I was going to say, in, in my former life working with, uh, you know, IFT, um, the Global Food Traceability Center, I was exposed to, you know, a large number of EPCIS solutions and, and also with the Global Dialogue on Seafood Traceability encouraging the use of EPCIS across seafood. So, yeah, so that was, you know, prior prior life. I just haven't seen that that data actually ripple through to the FDA yet, so. Thank you, ahead, John. Andrew, for, for, for that. Um, I, just for the people in the audience who may be wondering why a government doesn't come out and say use GS1 standards, a government cannot come out and be prescriptive. They have to leave it up to industry to do that themselves. So. Uh, it's not normal for a government to mandate any particular way of doing stuff. There is uh, one exception in the area of FDA around drugs, where they point out the GS1 standards or the HIVIC standards or another standards that are there. So that is not normally something that a government or a regulator would, uh, would normally do. Um, it's up to industry to define how to be compliant with, uh, with the regulation. So, uh, Brent, we're over to you if you have a question for uh, Andrew. And then I'll have some questions for all of you. Brent, we're? Yeah, um, actually, um, I'm, I'm all out of questions for Andrew at this point. I suggest we continue the discussion. Okay, so I, I had a question around um, government involvement and maybe Andrew, um, I don't want to put you on the spot, so you can you can decline to answer this if you like. But we do have. I wanted my question is around the importance of uh, regulatory bodies either participating in or being an observer in some of the groups like like Trace Alliance. We do have a a, a policymaker joining us, and we have a research department from another government to, to, uh, joining us as well. Um, what is your perspective on observing what are these, these groups are doing and maybe even providing some inputs from the regulatory perspective? Um, yeah, in general, we're more than happy to observe. And I think there's value, um, you know, with the uh, Leafy Green Action Plan um, uh, traceability pilot uh, that was done last summer, we were invited to join uh, and observe that. And I think it's really useful to see um, three traceability teams. And, and I guess this is a recommendation too for the people kind of listening is they, they basically sent out a secret shopper and bought uh, multiple products. And then the traceback teams were only given a certain amount of information. And so they had to emulate what it was like to be a regulator and do a traceback investigation, which was informative for them, you know, putting themselves in our shoes and it was informative for us because we could watch and see how they came up with different solutions. So we tend, you know, our, our traceback investigators have sort of developed methodologies over time that get repeated with every outbreak. So we don't generally have the opportunity to try out different things. And this was an opportunity to watch groups with no preconceived notions, no methodology, just figure it out. And, and it, was, it was pretty cool. So we, we learned a lot in that process about how we can improve our own internal process. So that's had really good knock-on benefits. Um, so yeah, so participating in things like that where we can observe and, and potentially uh, if we're in a, right now we're in a rule writing process 
for the proposed you know traceability rule so we're limited in what we can say but uh, out, when we're outside of a rule writing process, we can certainly participate as subject matter experts and offer our experience and our analysis. We're you know, somewhat hamstrung until that, that rule is finalized next year. But uh, yeah, as a general case, it's, it's always interesting to see how solutions are developed so that we, we can learn you know, how, how to ask better questions and how to analyze the data better that we get. Yeah, of course. And I think uh, Andrew maybe beneficial when once we complete uh, the work, uh, the academic work on interoperability and semantic web, that we share the working paper with the FTA and other regulators like CFIA in Canada, and others to get their inputs as well, uh, at least their views. Um, okay, so I want to go on to a point uh, that several people mentioned on Twitter yesterday when I asked for questions for today and. It actually speaks to what Andrew just spoke about is low cost or no cost. And, and the, the two questions I got very frequently, how do, we, how do we actually develop these low cost solutions? But at the same time, are they necessary to drive the adoption? What is the missing link today? In other words, why are we going out looking for low cost solutions? Is it a deployment issue? Is it a technology issue? Is it proprietariness of technologies? Uh, is there too much of a land grab by solution providers? And, and in that context, does open source play an important role? I know that's a, a multifaceted question, but it's around the developing the low cost and the deployment. How do we encourage that deployment that Andrew and the team at FDA are looking for? Maybe if I start with Steve and then I'll go to and, uh, Brent Vladimir, and then I'll go to Andrew. Steve, so how, how do we bridge that gap if we have low cost solutions? to deployment based on your experience? Yeah, so that's a that's a loaded question. I'm not sure I'll really answer exactly what you're asking there, but in terms of getting, um, you know, in terms of getting solutions in place, I was uh, responding to Paul Larkin's question on the on the chat. One of the main reason, reasons that we get people to adopt standards is we show them the value that it provides them to their bottom line. So if we have an additional, you know, if you have a low cost solution, um, but they don't get any additional value out of it. It often is not as pertinent to them as a um, more costly solution that actually has a greater long-term effect on their revenues and net profitability. And so really showing people how this affects other areas is going to be a big deal. We never were able to get folks to adopt security printing processes in their packaging until we showed them that it allowed them to step around the entire morass of their supply chain and have a direct connection between the manufacturer and the customer. So for example, if you had a barcode on a package that also had a very difficult to replicate mark next to it, one of the things we did was actually have them read the barcode and then it would connect them to the manufacturer and they would show what should be next to it on the package. That made that the target for a would-be counterfeiter. And so it was a little bit higher cost solution may have cost them two or three cents more per package, which is a lot of money when you multiply that by a large supply chain. Um, mm -hmm. But the value that was added there in terms of having the customers connect directly to the brand and understand irrespective of whether they bought it in a Target, in a Walmart, in a 7-Eleven, at a quick, you know, quick shop or whatever, anywhere they bought this material, they could go direct to that manufacturer and establish that brand link. It was super powerful. And so really what we're looking for each of these things, and I think the best way for us as Trace, you know, Alliance, as any, you know, as, um, you know, Trace Labs, as anybody who's trying to make this happen in the industry is for us to always be looking for those ancillary opportunities to provide value and really recognize you know, and, and so I'm talking about the carrot because it's always nice to talk about the, the positives, but there's also removal of the punishments there. If you've done everything in your best effort, if you're going to pass the New York Times test because you've put your best foot forward to try to prevent these types of fraud, it's going to be a lot better for you should something, you know, heaven for fend go wrong with your supply chain. And I think, <laughs> I think it's a lot of places recognize that stick. And they're like, well, you know, unless I'm actually going to be penalized for this happening, 
what's the big deal? And so really, I think a, a big area for us is that sort of gray area right now in showing people how just because something isn't required of them doesn't mean it's not required of them in the world we live in. With social media, with everything else, you may not have done something and it wasn't illegal, but all of a sudden, because you didn't do it and people find that out, you've lost tremendous brand value. And so this is one of the advantages that we have of the sort of reactionary social media that we have today. And there's some disadvantages, I get that. But one of the advantages we have is to actually convince people these are scenarios that would have been far-fetched five or 10 years ago that, you know, you could have swept under the rug. You could have said, oh, I didn't want to do trace labs because that cost me, you know, an extra 0.5 cents per package. And you're like, really? That's like, you know, that's the probably the cheapest insurance you could have possibly had in this area. Would you not pay for insurance for to mitigate supply chain issues if, for example, you know, all, there was a global health crisis, which we have just gone through with the pandemic and all these other things. So it's, it's an insurance policy that kind of bridges between the carrot and the stick, the positives that we can have, because investing in that also allows you to convey a positive message to people. Why are we insuring our supply chain? We're insuring our supply chain because first off, we believe in it. We don't think it's there. We think it's added value. But then it's also, you know, taking into account if there's any contingencies there, we've done our best, even when it wasn't legally required. And that's the hard part. And I'm, I, and I'm sure mo many people on this call, including Andrew, have spent a lot of their career trying to sh explain to people you have to use predictive analytics, right? Smart predictive analytics, figure out types of things that could go wrong before you actually have them. We, we see climate change happen before people are actually ready to put into place the ways to remediate it. And so really what we're talking about here are global massive changes in supply chain because of personalization. We see personalized medicine, for example. Medicine is 20% of the GDP in the US. It's moving towards a personalized medical area and, and the pandemic's only accelerated that. It's gonna have massive changes in the medical supply chain. Much more is gonna go direct from manufacturer or service provider to somebody's home rather than being mediated through a clinic, a hospital or other location. And so all of these things are happening before people are actually ready to acknowledge that. And so our goal as you know, the Trace Alliance as, as any other organization, GS1, et cetera, is to show people this is the future these are the ones we can really count on happening. These are the things that are, you know, a little more speculative, but we'll also provide that for you. And what you really want to do is be able to do the right thing before it is uh, litigated, you know, before it's legislated. And that's a really tr tricky thing because people are like, well, how do you know that's going to happen? It's not on the books yet. We'll take a look around you, show them examples, show them, you know, success, you know, one of the things we're really focused on right now in cyber physical security are attacks on critical infrastructure. So we have examples. We have cities in Florida where the person just happened to see his mouse moving on his screen, you know, so he knew something was going wrong, right? But we didn't have other protocol in place other than a really sharp guy paying attention to what was going on on this computer. We would have had no idea that was going on. And so we see pipelines being hit. We're seeing things moving from a situation where there's extortion to ransomware. And so all of those things are going on. We can look at those macro trends and say, by the way, that's why we're working on this alliance now. Yes, it's not legislated yet. And you may not see the need for it, but project these other trends towards customization, personalization, towards you know social media, and we see a lot of this stuff happening. So, John, I should stop. I'll throw it back to you. But those are kind of my ideas in that space. Oh, great, great insights, Steve, and thank you for that. So, I guess in in the work group as well, we have to be cognizant of that because it's not um, it, it's not you know the Trace Alliance per se that benefits from this. It's by providing the knowledge, the knowledge gap, the proof of concepts to all of the solution providers and the participants so they can come up with a unit of measure, whether it's by product, uh, to be able to look at developing a business case for customers and go to market, very similar to what Andrew just pointed out. How do we bring this to market cheaper, faster, and, uh, and, and, and affordable? Uh, Brandemir, how do we bridge that gap between a low-cost solution and uh, you know, the full deployment? How do we get more people on board? Yeah, so th that's a very difficult question, and it's it's um, 
that's all I ob obviously it's one of the points of the challenge to provide such solutions there's many ways to do it there's some ways that um, I could argue at, at the beginning start uh, at the start of this answer is how not to do it uh, a lot of the people would um, in the last couple of years really position uh, certain technologies as kind of like the be all end all solution for all kinds of supply chain uh, problems and one of the the, the most uh, sort of um, um, uh, the one that was put on the pedestal the most was really blockchain now not to say that i'm not a fan of the technology but it itself uh it does have quite a lot of scalability and really price issues so if you were to use be that a public or a or private blockchain instance, in that case, you will get to significant cost. And, but not only that, it's actually having the blockchain not tackling things like interoperability or issues like inter interconnectivity that we mentioned. It's very good for integrity though, but uh, at, a, at an extremely high cost. So um, one of the key things to, to go for when building a low or no cost solution is, first of all, picking the right infrastructure for it. Um, and uh, there, there's obviously decisions that have to be made uh, along the way. Uh, but I mean, Andrew will surely say more on this topic, but uh, when we're talking about food supply chains, it is obvious why this has to be uh, cheap. Uh, we're, we're talking about products uh, that um, um, within this wide range of food supply chains um, span all kinds of different prices as well as uh, very low margins generally on, on them. And that means there's not a lot of room to add, like Steve already mentioned, um, you know, adding cents on a product might turn out to be a huge cost. And uh, therefore, um, you know, if you introduce something additional uh, as, as, uh, as uh, in the solution, it has to be cheap, obviously, or even low, uh, low cost. Now, uh, when it comes to blockchain uh, per se, uh, not to say that it's completely wrong to use it, actually provides quite some very beneficial uh, components to the system, but it's used right. And uh, like I mentioned, a couple of them, um, it's, it's important for uh, managing decentralization, like decentralized identity, um, uh, making verifiability the first class citizen of such systems. So it can help with actually making sure that a certain party in the supply chain did say a certain thing or did publish a certain data set or uh, can claim that a certain event or um, situation has happened at a certain point in time. Uh, so it's definitely an important component to, to providing the integrity and identity for, for these claims. However, not necessarily to be used as a database. Uh, that's where, uh, from a technical standpoint, most uh, probably a database will be better, depending on the use case. Um, so going on, on that, uh, to, to try and wrap up, the idea is to build on scalable technologies, uh, to implement the right technologies in the right places, and then wrap it up together in some sort of an interoperable product, because otherwise it won't it won't matter that it's only low or no cost, right? Uh, if it's it's not able to interact with the rest of the world, like Steve uh, very well introduced at the beginning, is uh, you know you bring this great new thing into the manufacturing, but everybody's like, all right, how does that work with with what I already have? And uh, I believe that's that's the key uh, important thing here to, to focus on, uh, which is not to just um, uh, uh, have the cost in mind as, as the first, uh, obviously very important factor, but also interoperability. Uh, and that's why we've, uh, from the perspective of Trace Labs, have been using the decentralized knowledge graph as the backbone of all the solutions that we've been building, because it utilizes blockchain where it makes sense, it utilizes knowledge graph technology for interoperability and for as this novel data structure that is really designed for data exchange in a semantic way. And uh, it connects very easily to legacy systems. So, you know, it speaks things like GS1 EPCS or uh, generally G it's, it's very aware of GS1 um, keys, all kinds of standards, but not just that, also other W3C standards. So essentially covering very, very various different areas. Um, and that's really how you get affordable scalability. So something that gets the benefits of, of all of these uh, different uh, systems altogether. Uh, building a low cost solution with, with the right approach is then uh, absolutely possible. And I actually encourage everybody on the call to, to participate in the FDA challenge and to look up Origin Trail as the backbone for, for the solutions that uh, 
they might be uh, applying for, for the competition. So you're saying the origin trail could be the Intel inside for the interoperability. <laughs> that is what we are here for. <laughs> Wonderful. Andrew, over, over to you. Uh, I wanted to, you, you've forgotten more than most people will know about supply chains and technology. So respecting that and prior to the FDA rule, did you see any common themes that, that aids in deployability of solutions? Is there any secret sauce? And I'm gonna add a second component onto that, bringing it up to today. Is there, is there any focus today within the FDA about looking at solutions that can prove their value across the 17 UN SDG goals? So the first one is on the secret sauce. The second one is, have you the SDG goals on your radar yet? Um, okay, so so on the on the first one, thinking about um, you know low cost or no cost solutions, um, I'll, I'll I'll share some examples, you know, real life examples where traceability kind of baked into um, uh, business models. So you don't even think about it, but it is effectively a low cost solution. So uh, take the FedEx envelope. That's a classic use case where traceability, real time, you know, you know where the package is, uh, or quasi real time, at least points along the way, uh, you know where your package is. So that adds value to the delivery service and also enables the delivery service. But they don't have a separate traceability system so they don't have like the system that manages the movement of packages and then a separate QR code that goes on the package that the consumer can scan and and it's sort of like just the consumer facing traceability. No, they have the one system, you know, they, and and so the, it's single point of entry, all the information that they use for their own operation also drives that consumer information. So basically for them, consumer facing traceability is free. It just comes along for the ride and it adds value to the product and enables them to charge a lot more for, for overnight delivery service um, than organizations that don't have that visibility into their supply chain. So that, that's one, you know, kind of an older example. A more recent example of more uh, precise traceability is things like uh, DoorDash, Uber Eats, things like that. When you order something, it tells you, you know, it gives you an estimate on when it's going to be delivered, when it's going to be picked up. As soon as there's a driver associated, it tells you who the driver is, and then you have real-time tracking of your order as it comes to you. So you know exactly where they are. You can communicate with them in real time. Uh, you can make adjustments on the fly. It's a really different traceability experience than what you have in the supply chain. Imagine if you had that level of interactivity with your co-manufacturer. Like just imagine that kind of connectivity. It would be game changing for, for brand owners. So that's what, a, you know, traceability is being adopted into business models. And, and you know, talking about the blockchain, a model, you know, so I'm having to upgrade my analogies because blockchain is moving so fast. But originally I used to talk about crypto kitties and the pedigree of a crypto kitty and, and, and then combining crypto, crypto kitties, breeding them to make other crypto kitties is essentially a transformation of it, right? So, so you, you can basically map your EPCIS events onto the crypto kitty world and, and imagine that as an analog for traceability. But now with NFTs, it's, it's gone even bigger. So basically a crypto kitty is, is just an NFT. And uh, so, so you can imagine the, the traceability underpinnings and the pedigree of, of a digital asset you have traceability built in. It's just part of it, but they don't sell separate traceability. It's not like, well, you can have an NFT with traceability as an upgrade. No, you, like you, it's part and parcel of the business model. So I think that's where I see the effectiveness of traceability is when it's baked into the business model, it's part of the delivery mechanism and you don't even think about it. It just happens. And, and you're not like banging the drum saying, oh, this one's traceable and this one's not. Consumers don't want to hear that. They want to know it's all traceable. So like make traceability sort of disappear into the background. And that, that when we talk about business models, uh, you know, they're low and no cost. That's, you know, some of the thinking that I think we need to rethink how we, how we talk about traceability and how it's baked into the food supply chain. 
very important, Andrew. Thank you for that. And so just a quick question on the SDG goals. Um, is it beneficial for companies who are um, submitting their application for uh, for the competition to also align with the SDG goals, or is it not, not that important right now? Yeah, it's totally independent. So we wanted you know this challenge to be wide open because we we wanted new ideas. So we didn't want to bound them with you know existing frameworks. So that's why we we didn't put out a list of these are the challenges that you need to overcome or these are the specific areas where it's got to be low or no cost. We really we just wanted to be a Rorschach test. You tell us what you think are the issues, how you would solve them in a perfect world. How are you solving them today? Like, we really wanted it to be wide open. Gotcha. Wonderful. Thank you for that, Andrew. Steve, um, Andrew mentions that we have to change how we discuss uh, traceability. We have to look at it as embedded in the business model. Um, could you comment on that for one or two minutes? Uh, we have about five minutes to go. Yeah, well, that's a great comment. I mean, it's actually absolutely implicit in terms of moving forward into customization, personalization, and being able to adopt things. So going back to the additive manufacturing model, you go from a situation in which something goes wrong with your sink, say, and you have to get buy a part from Kohler to now being able to either go out to something like, you know, Thingiverse and 3D print it yourself or at a mom and pop shop, or you can get it from you know, a local, you know, maker market, et cetera, all of a sudden, instead of having one model of getting it, you could have pieces that are in your house or in your car or in your critical infrastructure that have been made by a combination of brands, open source like Thingiverse and local stores or any combination of those. So you go from having one source to seven because it could be A, B or C, A and B, a and C, B and C, or A, B and C, the complexity that's there scales very quickly as we start to allow more and more person, 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 personages, I guess what we'd say, or different uh, contributors into that supply chain. And as you move forward, that's an equitable way to go. It allows everyone to participate. If somebody has critical value to add, they can be brought in, but the complexity does not scale linearly. So the complexity of how things can be manufactured is a geometric feature of how many participants there are, whereas the number of participants goes up linearly. And what Andrew is talking about and what he has been pushing for many years anticipates that disparity in complexity that you add in a supply chain when you have more providers versus the, you know, the we as, as a species, humans like to think linearly and we go, well, if you go from a million people in a supply chain to two million, it's twice as complex. No, it's not. Right? It's going to be much more complex because the number of interactions goes up geometrically rather than linearly. And I think that's really what we're trying to do here is anticipate the level of complexity increasing over time. At that, I'll stop and throw it back to you, John. Wonderful. Thank you for that fantastic uh, comment, Steve. Vladimir, I'll give you one minute, and I want to give one minute to Andrew, and then I'll do a closing. Over to you on, on that point of the business model. I'll, I'll just uh, expand to agree on, on the last couple of points, especially the ones around NFTs. And what, what I really want to uh, add on, on that is that um, uh, apart from just emulating uh, EPCN's transformation events, there's actually, um, as um, already Steve mentioned, the geometric uh, uh, or really a, a network effect, a Metcalfe's law network effect uh, thing going on there that's, that's going to happen. Which is going to happen on the, the level like uh, very similar to the internet in a way. Uh, first, having these websites uh, have some weird structure in Web 1.0, Web 2.0, we actually got a little more interaction, and all of a sudden we got these amazing search engines that were actually indexing all kinds of things. And things like NFTs and all of these um, uh, uh, events and, and identifiers and supply chains are going to be uh, discoverable to some, some form of a search engine which actually operates on the notion of, of a decentralized knowledge graph uh, and is one of the things that uh, we are trying to build as our origin trail uh, or really this Google for supply chains. And uh, in that way, you get kind of invisible traceability. Like today you get uh, to search anything in Google and that's a normal thing. It's like, you know, an everyday activity that you don't no longer pay attention to because you do it as kind of a normal thing. Uh, we see the, the future being that like that for traceability where you will be able to query uh, a decentralized knowledge graph and find anything you need uh, and really uh, have it structured interoperable so you can 
either put it in a system that you need or as a consumer, just view it through some interface. Um, so yeah, looking forward to that future and uh, it's definitely a future that is going to be involving multiple frameworks, including NFTs. I'm sure that, that there's uh, quite a lot of interesting cases there. We will be publishing one of these frameworks uh, within the next month, actually. Fantastic. I'm going to give the last word to uh, Andrew. Now, Andrew, first, before I give you the last word, I want to say congratulations and thanks to you and also Frank Yanis and the broader team for the level of engagement that you've uh, you've started at the FTA with the new area of smarter food and with this low cost, no cost challenge. That's very unique and it's very forward thinking. I think the world is looking at you and what uh, and Frank and what the team are doing. So congratulations on that. I'll give you the, the final minute for your final comments and, and guidance to uh, the Trace Alliance team. Great. Well, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to present and thank you for the kind words. That's awesome. Uh, but and if you are going to participate in the challenge, you know, feel free to reach out and contact me uh, anytime through the, the chat board or, or directly. Um, and, and also, you know, w when you're setting up your, uh, your response to the challenge, go pitch it to your neighbor. If your neighbor doesn't understand it, Odds are good, our judges are not gonna understand it. So I, you know, our judges are great, but they're not super technical, you know. So the the, the different variants of blockchain types are, is gonna be lost on them. You have to explain to them in human language, this is the challenge I'm trying to solve. This is how I'm solving it. This is why it's cool and different. And this is why it's low cost and no cost. So I just wanna get that out there. Like, imagine you're, you just go to your neighbor and explain it. So if you can do that, you're good. So, and I look forward to seeing you all in the challenge. Wonderful, thank you so much, uh, Andrew. Brandemir, CTO at uh, Trace Labs Origin Trail. Thank you so much, Professor Steve Sinti, University of Colorado State University. Thank you so much for your fantastic inputs and Andrew Kennedy from the FTA. Andrew, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to attend today. So thank you all, have a fantastic week, stay safe and mask up where necessary. Thank you.